Hi, I'm Gary Berman, host of the Unsung Cyber Hero Adventures podcast. Our mission is to shine the light on the unsung heroes who keep us safe while at work, home, and school. I'm the least likely person to be interviewing some of the world's top people in the cybersecurity community and beyond, including thought leaders from large enterprises, small and medium businesses, vendors, law enforcement, DOD, and others with the goal of humanizing cybercrime. Why? Well, here's my origin story. I started a market research uh, company, and after 10 years, I was able to sell 49% to a global organization. Things were going great, and then it happened, right under my nose. A trusted insider and tech contractor cloned my company, redirected calls to our operations, and became whistleblowers. They called my biggest clients, saying that there was fraud in my data collection operation, and that I was under investigation by the FBI and to stop all communications. Well, after a long battle, I lost everything, and it wasn't just my loss. I lost the whole company and had to lay everyone off. Well, to make a very long and complicated story short, I was unable to receive justice due to the difficulty of attribution. And I realized being a victim is unfortunate, but not unique. So I decided to pivot to become an advocate to help people stay safe online. But what next? I needed a crash course on the basics of cybersecurity, so naturally, I got a book called Cybersecurity for Dummies. After 10 pages, I was lost. That's when I realized there had to be a better way to distill complicated cybersecurity and tech information into something that people could understand and enjoy, not only those people in the tech and cybersecurity ecosystems. I watched Spider-Man and that's when it hit me, superheroes. My goal was to convert blinded real life stories of cybercrime into fun, engaging, empowering comics and animations. The Cyber Hero Adventures, Defenders of the Digital Universe was born. Having decided on the medium of superheroes, but where was I, where was I going to get the stories? Conferences. It turns out there are hundreds of cybersecurity conferences, so I began to attend all of them, and that's where I met our first guest, Anita De Amico. Say hi, Anita. Hi, Gary. So nice to see you again. Tell us your origin story. I have a very different origin story than most people in cybersecurity. So first, let's tell, I'll tell you where I am right now. I am the CEO of a startup called Code DX. The DX stands for diagnosis. And we help you diagnose security issues in your software. Uh, um, it, we recently received seed investment and I am scaling this company up. I'm very excited about it. And we're here to automate and make it easier for people to secure their software. But that's not where I started out. My training is as an experimental psychologist. I have a PhD in psychology. And my career arc has been different from most other people. For some odd reasons, I wound up in advanced technology almost my entire career. I worked on in the Merchant Marine on redesigning part of the Panama Canal. I worked on the manned space station. I designed the uh, displays for the ro robotic manipulator uh, system. I worked in parallel processing, in digital cartography, and eventually I wound up leading Northrop Grumman's first information warfare team. And that's how I got started in cybersecurity. Then I started a cybersecurity R&D organization called Secure Decisions, where we did all kinds of really interesting new technology development in areas such as uh, using comics for cybersecurity education. That's one of the ways that I met you, Gary. And uh, we did work on security visualization. And about 10 years ago, we started working in application security research. And we came upon a really interesting technology that we thought we could commercialize. And I strategically bid uh, research until we had enough funds to develop the technology that is now foundational to Codex. From there, we spun out a separate company, became a startup, got seed funding, and now we're cruising. That's my story. Oh, that's, that's a good story. And um, your seed money was incredible. You won a big contest. I did. Um, we were identified by a couple of uh, seed investors. There was one that was particularly interested in us, but they, uh, Data Tribe, but they really wanted me to compete in a Shark Tank-like competition uh, to see how I would do. So 
they had 200 pitch decks. They picked mine and a few and three others. And uh, we had a Shark Tank-like event on November 14th in Baltimore. And uh, I won. I won $2 million. Bravo. Um, OK, well, uh, Davina, you're going to have to follow that. Uh, Davina, uh, you want to say uh, hi to everybody and tell us a little bit about the cool stuff you're doing at uh, uh, NICE? Sure. So thanks so much. So I might not be as exciting as that, but just as different, which I'm, I'm finding is usually the case for women in cybersecurity. They have a completely different background. Um, my background is actually in chemistry, biochem, uh, testing JP5 jet fuels, but uh, got a little tired of working in a wet lab. So I moved over into education and teaching, taught at collegiate, at high school, um, four-year institution, two-year institution, really got interested in STEM education and moved on um, with my PhD in ed tech policy and then worked as faculty within the School of Education at, at University of Maryland College Park. And it was there around the time when cybersecurity, even though it's been around for forever, but when it really started to kind of bubble up as a STEM initiative, if you will, and um, got involved with some different NSF grants and some uh, regional efforts, uh, National Cyber Watch Center uh, served at, when it was a regional center served as a PI, um, and really found that niche within K-12 and enjoy it very much and uh, have since moved over into the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, which is led by NIST, which is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And I serve as the lead for academic engagement there, which is everything from K-12 all the way up through our two and four year institutions. But a good part of the portfolio is in K-12. And that is a, a really important uh, piece of the conversation is how do we, how do we, make youth as well as educators and teacher you know parents aware of the great opportunities in cybersecurity in terms of career and workforce development and so that's where a majority of my time is spent and it's an incredibly important mission uh davina was kind enough to invite me to give a, a speech at one of her events so davina why don't you tell us about uh, national cyber security career awareness week Excellent. Yes. So thanks so much. So we have two two uh, signature, we have a lot of activities, but the two signature programs are the National K-12 Cybersecurity Education Conference, as and then another event is the National Cybersecurity Career Awareness Week. And we have that. It's hosted in November. It's done in um correlation with the National Career Development Association. And we try to really spotlight careers on cybersecurity. So we, we recognize that October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month on digital literacy and internet safety and all those really important things for our community and our citizenship uh, folks to be aware of. But we want to spotlight the career options and and opportunities that are out there. So we have a special week really devoted to careers in this area, which we're trying to demystify exactly what cybersecurity is and, and for the public to become aware of that it's much more than somebody with a hoodie sitting on a you know, on a couch, on a laptop, hacking into somebody's um, other computers or network, kind of creepy. Um, but, you know, what are the other opportunities? The, you know, the psychology, the digital forensics, the policy, the law, um, engineering, computer science. And so that people recognize the different opportunities that are out there. Yeah, and especially right now, you know, um, because, you know, this uh, is pretty complicated. And I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, were there about 23 different careers that you identify within cybersecurity? So we do use the, the NICE 
cybersecurity workforce framework, and that is a lexicon that has the seven broad categories of cybersecurity. There are the 33 specialty areas and then the 52 work roles. So there are actually, at this point in time, although it is up for revision right now, there are 52 work roles. Wow. And most, most folks in uh, professionals and workers within the cybersecurity space might tap into several work roles in their position. We're not at that point where you have one person who has just one work role, um, but there are 52 different work roles and the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, the tasks and the competencies that go along with those. Well, speaking of someone who has multiple workloads, uh, in addition to uh, being a senior person over at Spirian, uh, Jen um, also uh, talks a lot about uh, balancing uh, work and home life, being a mom. Yes. Hi, Gary, and hi, everyone. So happy to be here, and, and thank you for including me. What a, what a great panel you've put together. Um, yes, I have actually started my career about 20 years ago. Um, I would say 15 of those 20 years have been in the high-tech space, um, specifically around business development. So I have helped um, charter some markets, um, specifically IT service management, um, IT quality and compliance, and then most recently, yes, I'm, I'm over at Spirion the last 90 days helping them with their data privacy under cybersecurity. So our, our mission at Spirion is really to protect what matters most. And how we do that is through very efficient um, data discovery. So understanding that you can't protect what you don't know you have or where it's at. So we actually help organizations understand um, what sensitive um, data they have, where it's located, and what they can do to remediate, redact that, and really minimize security breaches, data breaches that happen, and then also comply with uh, industry organizations like CCPA and GDPR. So um, we're on a mission to protect what matters most, um, which is you know our, our personal data, right? What would we be without our our personal data, we all have probably felt the negative effects of if, if someone has um, stolen our social security number or our date of birth, you know, all the things that we have to go through. And, you know, that can clearly be avoided or minimized, right, with, with using a solution like Experience. So very happy to be here. I'm certainly not a pioneer in the industry, but um, I'm helping carve out the data privacy sector for Experience underneath cybersecurity. Well, and you're also, you know, blazing the pathway um, to um, Eileen uh, Cosmano. Uh, Eileen is with Owl, De uh, Owl Defense, and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your origin story? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I, I went to school for, um, for public, public relations and communications. I went to minor in marketing, um, and I graduated in 2014 and started my career as the second marketing hire at a uh, market research company, very small market research firm. And so we did a ton of um, basically grassroots programs to kickstart them, their marketing programs um, and projects. We put together an online store and um, put, put events together and PR and social media and a digital presence. Um, and that really propelled me into learning um, the many different areas of marketing, um, and especially for a technology company, it really sparked my interest of um, learning how to creatively um, tell messages for complex um, for complex solutions. Um, so, so finding creative ways to tell that message um, so that people can understand them better. Um, so, was there for four years and then joined Owl Cyber Defense a year and a half ago, and um, again. Uh, taking a very complex and highly technical product. Um, we have hardware cybersecurity solutions and finding ways to creatively come up with fun messaging um, that isn't highly technical um, and make, make it understandable um, and put some creativity behind it to make it fun. Um, Cause a lot of cybersecurity um, marketing is uh, fear-based. So we try to take a different approach to it and 
bring some light and fun to it and say, hey, you shouldn't be scared of this stuff. It's it's needed and especially with the cyber threat landscape growing, um, you can't ignore it. So uh, we, we definitely try to take a, a more creative and um, fun approach to it and it's definitely worked, it's paid off. So so yeah, I, I, uh, I've really enjoyed working in the cyberspace. Um, I've learned a lot, not only about marketing, but also um, my technical background has has been has grown just uh, because you have to learn about this stuff in order to market it. So it's really uh, helped me develop more of a technical expertise too. Oh, that's really cool. I think you've landed on the secret sauce, and and in the uh, in this world of uh, alphabet soup, there's there's uh, the initials F U D. Uh, it stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Right. And that's been kind of the vibe of the cybersecurity ecosystem you know, uh, quite some time. Um, last but not least, Neem O'Connor. Uh, I had the privilege of having her as uh, our intern and, uh, and she just landed her first job. Hi, Gary. Hi, everyone. Thanks for including me. Um, it's muted, just so you know. So maybe if I edit it, I'm going to put <laughs> audience applause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so my name is Neve O'Connor. I am a SOC analyst um, at Cyber Reason. We're an endpoint detection and response company. Um, so my job is to monitor customer environments and uh, like investigate activity that's happened that's triggered what we call a MALOP, which is short for malicious operations. And I've got to investigate really cool malware um, during this recent pandemic. We've seen attackers using COVID or Corona as a way to infect machines. So it's what we investigate and what we see daily is it's cool to relate it to the, the real world, what's really happening in the physical world um, and mirroring that in the cyber world. Uh, but my start in cybersecurity isn't as intense as everyone else's. I went to undergrad for sociology I had a minor in computer applications and I did not know what I wanted to do in life. I was planning on taking a year off from school to work, um, whether that was in a restaurant or whatever, a part-time job, just to you know make some money and then figure out what I wanted to do. A uh, week before graduation, we had an alumni come into one of my computer classes and he was talking about how he was in this graduate program for cybersecurity and he pulled out, I'll never forget, he brought, pulled out his keys and he had two different tools on it. And he's like, well, I can't tell you exactly what I do, uh, but I investigate uh, like memory dumps from computers and phones. And I just remember thinking, wow, that is so cool. That's exactly what I wanna do. So I applied, I got in, uh, I have a graduate degree in cybersecurity with a concentration in computer forensics. And yeah, like Gary said, I just landed my first cybersecurity job. Um, and it's a great company to work for. Um, I haven't had any issues. Uh, we are, we're one of the companies, cybersecurity companies that have about 30 to 35 to 40 percent women. So it's a great culture to be part of. Um, and we're growing rapidly. Um, more women are joining. So it's been a great experience so far. You know, what a unique experience we have right now in this moment with our panel, because uh, we can really kind of see uh, how, if and how, things have changed uh, the role of women in, in the cybersecurity ecosystem, uh, you know, based upon almost years of experience. So, uh, Anita, let, let's turn back to you. You know, you in many respects uh, were uh, and are still uh, a pioneer. What was it like when you first uh, entered the cybersecurity or technology ecosystem? I like the way that you refer to me as pioneer. It's better than referring to me as old. <laughs> uh, when I first started, there were no women in this area uh, and in technology in general. The first conference that I went to out of graduate school, I, there were literally a hundred men and me. And almost every speaker got up there and said, Lady and gentlemen, <laughs> every single one. So, and 
you know, all the eyes were on me. And what I learned later on was that none of them actually thought I knew anything. Um, the, it, you know, as, as I grew in my career, they would tell me that they never really took me seriously in the beginning. Uh, when I was at uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, a few years later, I was promoted into an executive role and I was invited to an executive meeting and I counted 104. I actually literally counted 104 people there. There were four women. I was one of the four and I was there by special invitation. My promotion hadn't yet come in and the other three were making coffee. And so I, I distinctly remember the first time that I went to a business meeting uh, and it was with, uh, I was doing research in cybersecurity uh, for the federal government. And I was in a meeting, there were three of us and we looked around and we all realized that we were, the, it was three women. It was the first time I had ever been in a meeting where there were no men. And I distinctly remember that. And the same thing happened to all three of us. And we looked around and it was like our guards went down. It was like this release of tension because we realized there were no men there and that, and uh, we could discuss our clothes <laughs> and, and, uh, and our children and our dogs. And uh, which you, know, you shouldn't do, you know, when I, was, when I was growing in this industry, you didn't talk about your personal life. Uh, and so th things have changed quite a bit. Uh, now, I mean, there are uh, many women in cybersecurity. They're still underrepresented, but uh, there are a, a lot of, women in cybersecurity. And um, now I can walk into a room and be taken seriously. Maybe that's just because I'm a pioneer, Gary, or, <laughs> or, or maybe that's because the world has actually changed. I like to think that the world has actually changed and I don't have to prove myself every time I open my mouth. Well, thanks for that amazing background. Davina, in, in your role, you have kind of a unique perch because, you know, you work uh, within the federal government. How have things uh, changed for women in, in terms of the government and, and your role within it? Well, I think in terms of the, the number of women in all roles, whether federal or non-federal, there's still a lack there could be more of we've seen an uptick over time but it's not not where it should be um you know i think that does become important to share the not only the awareness of the opportunities but the awareness of the the plethora of different different options that are out there that you don't have to be pigeonholed in just to just to one uh, there are also we're seeing you know some federal efforts in trying to work with different pay scales within at least the federal government and in recruiting um, veterans and um, military and military um, families in upskilling and reskilling um, in using this particular time to have, you know, using the time to train yourself in in some of these activities so hopefully uh, some people are not only learning new new skills but they're also um maybe crossing over into cybersecurity. so i uh, i think there's there's we're we're making small steps but good steps yeah, again, you know, was um, this kind of balancing act of, of being a parent or, or being a mom. And um, one of the things that attracted you to Spirion was the culture of uh, diversity and inclusion. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, when I was in my probably mid to late 20s, I had a supervisor you know, tell me, hey, I, I see a lot of potential, I see a lot of talent. Um, I hear you've been talking about you know, wanting to start a family. You know, I'm here to tell you that if you if you do that, it's only going to slow you down in your career. And I took that as a challenge and said, no, you know, I'm not going to let that slow me down. What do I need to do to balance both? Right. At the time, I wasn't ready to start a family. But yes, he had heard correctly. 
but that was certainly something that was was on my radar. And what I what I did was I, I confided in some mentors, and you know they said continue to sharpen your skills, right? Continue to sharpen your craft, kind of what Davina just said. You know you you've got to really hone in on what you're really good at. And then really the sky's the limit for you, right? Whether you want to throw a family in, you know, another house in or whatever it is that you want in your life, you know, you just got to be really good at what your, you know, what your craft is. So I did that. And I, I tell you, you know, I have three children now. I, I did wait until I was in my late thirties before I had them. Um, and it, it is a balancing act, but I tell you it can be done, um, but it's really important if you want to continue to climb that you do hone in on your craft. And for me, that's really been the business development side of taking um, uh, lyrics to market, right? That help uncover the need and the proof points and then showing how solutions fit into that. So, so very proud of you know, being able to prove that person wrong so many years ago um, and, and really align myself with companies like Spirion. Um, you know, Spirion, has just about 9% over the industry average of, of women in our cybersecurity company, our data privacy company. So, you know, we're, we're, we're happy about that. Would I say we're proud about that? No, you know, we're not. That needs to be more. We need to see more women in this field. And one thing that um, I brought to the leadership team is that if you want to have more diversity, you know, at especially the executive level, you've got to open up educational doors for um, women or anyone wanting to climb the corporate ladder. Um, I forget what the percentage is, but the majority of, of women not taking that leap into a leadership role is because of a, a lack of business acumen, understanding how to read a profit and loss statement, right? So opening up education you know, to folks is really the key to diversity in, in my experience and what we've done um, over at Spirion is where we've launched courses that employees can take that will give them that business acumen to climb that ladder, right, and take on those leadership roles. And that's really how we plan to see those diversity numbers, you know, that we have. Yes, we're 9% above the fold, but we would like to see it more balanced. And by offering up more educational doors, you know, that's, that's our approach to addressing this. Sounds promising. Um, Eileen, you know, one of the uh, interesting uh, things about cybersecurity is that there are so many different, uh, not just career paths, but um, uh, areas of expertise and sectors of the economy. Um, our, our work uh, focuses on about 16 of the Department of Homeland Security uh, designated critical infrastructure sectors. And I know that um, all defense is, is quite expert at power generation and, and protecting, uh, you know, uh, our, our power grid and things like that. Uh, what have you learned about that uh, since you've been with the company? Sure. Um, so before I joined the company, I didn't know that people could hack into a grid and interrupt the infrastructure of the company. Um, so it's definitely not only valuable for my role, but just as a civilian to, um, to learn the, the threats that are out there and how critical and important it is to protect the grid. Um, so um, just learning the different channels and ways. Um, I mean, I used to carry around a USB stick all throughout college and high school and um, small things like that can be detrimental. Um, if someone carries a USB stick into a facility and inserts it and it has malicious content on a lap, um, inserts into a laptop. So um, small things like that you don't realize could totally interrupt, you know, a, an entire power grid. Um, and it's, it's really rewarding to, to work for a company that r really provides solutions that protect our, our nation's power. Um, we, we also work a lot with uh, the U.S. government and Department of Defense. Um, so we, we provide solutions for, for the U.S. government. So um, I take a lot of pride in um, the solutions that our team engineers, knowing how, how impactful they are on the country. Well, and one of your cool uh, solutions. World. One of your cool solutions is, is kind of point to point, you know, and, and one unidirection or bi-directional communications with uh, infrastructure. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So we have um, our core bread and butter solution is a data diode. So it's, um, it's a one way transfer of data and it's actually, um, it utilizes physics 
to um, ensure that that's, that communication is one way. So it sends data um, via a light, which is received by a phototransmitter. Um, so there's no way for the, the light to be shined back in the opposite direction. It can only absorb light, it can't redirect it. Um, so that's actually bound by physics. Um, there's no way to a photo receiver, there's no way for a receiver to send any any sort of communication back. Um, so uh, it's it's very secure and um, it's it's really uh, been around our technology has been around for over 20 years. Um, but we're just starting to really ramp up that global reach um, in working with companies around the world. Um, we've expanded to Europe and the Middle East. So um, the, the, the more the, thriver, the, the more the cyber threat landscape increases, um, the more hardened solutions the world needs. Yeah, and it's pretty interesting because it's a physical device, you know, not just a cyber, right. right? Correct, yeah. So we utilize, it's a combination of hardware and software, um, but the, the actual, um, the actual sending of data is performed through the the, uh, the the light and the photo receiver. So yes, there is hardware. It's hardware enforced. Yeah, that's correct. Pretty, thanks for that. Can you, yeah. what, can you tell us um, like kind of a blinded uh, real life story of cyber crime that you worked on? I, I remember the other day we were talking about this cool thing you got to work uh, overseas. Yeah, so that wasn't directly related to a cyber threat, but recently I was, so I got the, the job at Cyber Reason last July, and I was there for a little less than four months, and they asked me to go work on site with a customer in Scotland. Uh, so I was there for five weeks, and I was doing a lot of threat hunting, so we would run queries in the environment and then investigate the activity and see what what's going on is this malicious is this a true positive or is this part of everyday workflow um, so it was pretty cool we did get to see um, like fin7 activity um, so it was phishing emails and stuff so that was kind of cool to like look into um, but yeah it, it a lot of what I do daily I, the information comes right to our ticketing system. And then I, it's not really threat hunting. It's more of investigating that one particular uh, activity or event. Um, so it's pretty cool to like, you know, be well-rounded. I can do an investigation on one event or I can actually go out and, you know, do my own hunting and see what is this process doing? Um, so it's been a learning experience. And because I'm new in this field, well, in the, in the work field, um, it's, it's challenging and I love a challenge. So I always push myself to be better. I do a lot of research, but yeah, I work with a great team. They're always there to support me and answer my questions, my endless questions. And you know, but yeah, no, that's great. We, uh, we also uh, talked about how uh, your company, you, there's a, a, a culture of inclusion. Um, can you just share with the audience, you know, a little bit about that and, and how the CEO sets the tone and the little things that pop up on TV and all that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so part of Cyber Reason, we have our core values, which are abbreviated as do new, which is daring, UBU, uh, never give up, ever evolving and win as one. So it's a huge team culture. Uh, I grew up playing sports, so I love the idea of being on a team and helping everyone to, you know, be successful to achieve this common goal, um, which is part of our mission and our vision to help protect our customers in the cyber world from these real life threats. Um, so we're constantly reminded of it. They're in our conference rooms. We have monitors that if they're not in use, they, you know, they show screen, be daring. Um, you know, here's someone, an example of how someone was daring or never gave up. And it's just like a lot of positive reinforcement and saying, hey, like, if this person can do it, you can do it too. Um, we have posters and everything. And I think one of the greatest things is that the CEO is very present in the office. 
And whenever he starts an event or um, a talk, he'll go through slides and kind of reinforce like, hey guys, this is how we should be uh, working every day to achieve these common goals. Here is our mission, here's our vision, here are our core values. So it's always there for us to see. It's a great reminder and everyone abides by it, which is great. You know, one of the amazing things that I just heard from both Eileen and, and Neem is the word, wow, this is really cool. And when I first started into this, you just would not hear those words. You hear strategic, you know, platform, uh, use case, you know, all these inhuman. I mean, I was a node, N-O-D-E, you know, <laughs> than a human. So it's very cool if I can use it to seek almost the the evolution of the way this uh, industry is being described live, uh, you know, right right now. Um, and uh, so back to you, um, uh, Anita, um, one of the cool things that I thought was some of the uh, research that you're doing right now about about human behavior as it pertains to uh, code development and making mistakes. <clears throat> the audience, uh, some of that uh, cool research. Oh, I'd love to talk about that. You know, I, with my background in psychology and the domain I'm working in as cybersecurity, uh, I'm always looking at opportunities where the two of them come together. And in fact, most of my career, I've been working on how to improve human performance. Uh, I'm the CEO of CodeDX, and CodeDX is in application security. Well, application security means securing software, and software is written by people. Uh, so my interest is in how do you get people to write more secure code and how do you efficiently and effectively test that code to make sure it's secure. Mm -hmm. So in my business side, we're working in the area of how to automate many of the most labor intensive parts of uh, application security testing. But I was interested in going back and shifting left to when the code is originally developed, how can you make sure that it's developed securely? So we initiated a research project that's looking at the human factors of writing secure or vulnerable code. And we actually looked at the characteristics of software developers, of development teams, and the work conditions that are associated with the accidental insertion of vulnerabilities into software. And we uh, did research uh, that was funded by the US government. And we also looked at a lot of the literature that's been um, written from academia and from industry on this topic. And we zeroed in on uh, a few factors that make a difference in a development team that if you control some of these factors, then you should be able to write more secure code. And if you are a vulnerability hunter, if you are looking for vulnerabilities, whether you're a black hat or a white hat, if you're looking for vulnerabilities in a code, you can actually look at certain parts of software, that let's say were written and committed after midnight or were uh, written by more than nine developers, and you can actually figure out where those vulnerabilities might be based on the human factors. You could tell I get very excited when I talk about this. Well, what are just uh, you know one or two conclusions? Like like should people be coding all night? I mean, do they should they be doing twenty four hour marathons, or are they going to make more mistakes by doing that? There's a, being a, a hero, you know, working late at night um, to get the code out is not is not going to make it more secure. Uh, that in general, human factors guidelines are not to work more than eleven hours. And that's true in the medical field, in aviation, and in all kinds of areas where complex mental activity is required. And so that should hold true for software developers as well, that you start seeing decrements in performance after 11 hours. There's also something uh, called circadian rhythm or body rhythm. And we all have it. Our, our alertness changes during the course of the day. And um, there's a cycle to it that's based on the chemicals in our bloodstream. And those chemicals start declining about 9, 10 o'clock at night. 
and they stay down until about six in the morning. And we know that performance in general declines during those periods. So, and we've found that software that is committed between midnight and 4 a.m. is likely to have more bugs in it than software that is committed at, let's say, 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, that makes so don't, don't, don't keep people telling your developers they've got to work, got to work, and got to work past midnight to get this out. They'll get it out, but you know what? You may pay the price in security. Well, that'd be good for everyone <laughs> because everyone needs sleep. And if there are less bugs or less vulnerabilities that the folks, you know, on this, uh, uh, in our audience and in our show today have to worry about. So thanks for the research you're doing. Davina, one of the interesting things that um, I'd like to ask you about is um, because you're in the federal government and you're constrained by rules and regulations just by definition, you know, how do you innovate? You know, the, the stuff you're doing is pretty innovative. Do you do you, do you bump up against these rules and regulations or like right right now you you couldn't uh, be on video because of a particular uh, uh, federal rule right now right well i would have to say that within nist we we there's a lot of innovation within the national institute of students and technology so that's that's great and there is a federal push in the government for innovation. That's one of the, the key factors that the U.S. is always um, always promoting. However, there are guidelines within the, the government that we have to um, have to abide by. So, you know, we have to be innovative. If we can't use one platform, we find a way to use another or find another uh, method to use it. So there, there are ways that we can get around, but it's always trying to push that boundary to, okay, if we can't do this, how, how, how more efficient or how more uh, effective or what's another way to do it. Hmm. And uh, what about uh, testing? Do, do they allow you to kind of sandbox, you know, things that, that you're trying in your role? Do they, do they allow you to, you know, fail and learn from it? Or how does that work? Well, certainly within the IT, so uh, the, the NICE program office is in the implied uh, cybersecurity division within the ITL laboratory, one of the laboratories within NIST. So within that group, there are many, many different um, uh, venues, you know, classified, unclassified, and different, everything from energy, robotics, you, you name it, cryptology, you know, the, the whole gamut. Our focus is on workforce development. So that's not quite the same thing, but I will say that we work with our partners to really be innovative in trying to, how can we push out more exciting activities to make them, as you were talking earlier, make them cool for students to want to get engaged in, in um, exploration. So we see an uptick in the number of um, cyber ranges, state and and regional cyber ranges that allow students to go in to sort of vir virtual sandboxes and play around without really, you know, taking down their whole school system in the process. Um, we see more of uh, using game gamification in uh, trying to get, you know, messaging out. We see everything from career awareness. When we had our focus group with uh, K-12 students, they said, you know, you got to come up with memes and use it in Instagram. And it's like, okay, that's not my forte, but we'll figure out how to do it. So uh, there's always, it's the partnering that we, we try to partner with those other, other groups with the federal government to, to work on innovative factors. Wow, that's cool. And speaking of cool, doing a, a podcast from home is I'm being called away just for a moment. So Neem, I'm going to throw your feet to the fire. And um, if you can have everyone go around and, and answer this question, what's keeping you up at night about cybersecurity? I should be back in a couple minutes. Yeah, so I guess we'll start with Jen. Sure. You know, I what's keeping me up at night, you know, around cybersecurity is I was reading an article a couple weeks back and 50% and of websites that um, have, I think, corona, coronavirus in their, their URL um, have potential for malicious activity, right? 
And as you think about how our world has changed over the last four to five weeks uh, from a business and school community, um, we've got more people working from home, right? Um, learning from home and they're using their own personal desktops or they're using what they had in the, you know, had in the office or school and bringing it home. How secure um, is the data that's on those desktops? And we have a, a CEO at, at Spirion that really puts, you know, the employees and community customers first. And, you know, we've offered up a, our data discovery desktop agent, you know, to anyone that wants it in the world. And what this agent does is you can deploy it on any, um, any desktop that you have, Windows desktop, and it will actually um, crawl to find that sensitive information like social security numbers, date of birth, driver's license, bank account numbers, and alert you to what is on your desktop and may not be um, encrypted, right, or protected um, you know, against you know, these malicious attacks that we know are happening. And as they really see the vulnerability of, of the world right now, you know, we're not seeing those, those cyber attacks less than anytime soon. In fact, they're rising. So, you know, keeping me up at night is how are, how's my, my niece who's in college now that's now home using her desktop, um, searching every day about the coronavirus for updates. How are we making sure that her, her, her private, you know, data is secured? You know, same with the people on the front lines. Um, you know, what are, what can we do to help? So by helping, you know, deploy this agent, you can understand and protect what you have. And we all need to be doing that because we will get back to some sense of new norm eventually. But until then, you know, we're in this together and whatever we can do to help uh, minimize um, the compromising of your, your personal data, you know, that's what Spirion's all about. And I know that's what, what keeps me up at night is how can we help the world protect that and not let the bad guys win any more than they already are. Oh, you might be on mute, Mia. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree. Like I said earlier, um, part of the investigations that we do, we've seen a lot of corona or COVID um, documents that are downloaded from emails and people are getting infected and they're home. They don't know how, they don't even know that they're infected with this malware or URLs that have it. Um, but I, I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong, Eileen. <laughs> No worries, it's Aileen, um, but it's it's Eileen with an A, um, but it's 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 fine. I get it all the time. <laughs> um, just going off Jen's um, Jen's comment, I feel like uh, there's been a lot of of more. There's been more vulnerabilities coming up in the past few weeks. Um, there's been even some some stuff with Zoom, um, how how there was vulnerabilities in the software. Um, I've seen stuff on Facebook of people, um, you know, share the name of your first car, share your maiden name, your middle name. And um, those are all ways for hackers to get your passwords um, and email phishing emails where, um, you know, it says here, click on this link for the most updated um, state of coronavirus, but really it's, you know, a masked email. Um, so I think, you know, that's definitely keeping us up as a marketing team at night because we're trying to generate content during this time to help the industry and our customers be as safe as they can be. Um, and it's getting, it's getting um, overwhelming to, to keep on top of all these, these new vulnerabilities that are popping up just, just within the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so we're, we're trying to hold webinars and create blog posts um, for pure education to um, just raise awareness on all of these, how to mitigate these, these risks and vulnerabilities so that people stay safe um, while they're working during coronavirus and also um, on their personal laptops and computers. How about you, Anita? What keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night are those uh, organizations that are deploying mobile apps and web apps that haven't been adequately tested for vulnerabilities and remediated. Uh, CodeDX is in the software security space. Our customers are, are testing their, their, web, their applications, whether they're uh, web applications, mobile applications, or, or other software systems. But there are a lot of organizations out there that aren't doing that. And we know 
that almost 90% of data breaches are directly traceable to an attacker exploiting a software vulnerability. Well, mobile apps and web applications are a huge attack surface. As people work from home more, they're doing more and more work through web apps and, and through mobile apps. And that is just, if, if those are vulnerable, then this is just a huge attack surface. And that is not lost on the attackers. They know that and they're going after it. And that's what keeps me up at night. And Davina, how about you? So mine is, of course, a different per perspective, maybe not as, as fun, but uh, one of the, the first things is how to prepare for a huge national conference uh, contingency plan, but that's, that's beside the point. One of the things that we're, we're seeing is the progress that we have made over the years in education in the K-12 space, particularly with an emphasis on STEM learning, so meaning not the individual silos of, of science, technology, engineering, or math, but the combination of those to really focus on collaborative uh, methods and, and team building and critical thinking and computational literacy, all the, all the positive things that we have seen have somehow kind of gone away with this new experience that we're, we're undertaking. We're seeing a lot of the teachers, both old and young, not really being tech savvy or seeing teachers unable or unfamiliar with how to do online teaching. They're trying to do the old methods in an online platform. Many of the students are not familiar or they're not disciplined enough to learn online. Um, not to mention having more pressing issues like my parents are both now out of jobs or equity issues. You know, there are some tribal locations that don't have um, running water or electricity so you know connecting is not not really high on their priority list um, and a lot of the instructional progress like I said with that we have made over the um, over the years has shifted back to just rote memorization which we've been trying to get away from we've seen a lot of our museums and after school activities having to kind of flip on a dime and think really quickly innovatively like what are they going to do because that's their bread and butter but yet if we are social distancing from from a while for a while you're not going to have a lot of folks visiting um, museums um, but one of the things that is really kind of interesting is the mention that the uptick in just the actual online fatigue is like everyone and their next door neighbor is now having mandatory meetings and so kind of the 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 um, awareness and the training and so some of the optional are no longer really appealing and that was that was some of the way that we were trying to build our workforce up and and try to get more people in the field to help help all of you answer or to address some of the questions that you just brought up is how do we develop that workforce under these current situations so just trying to re rethink and um and how how we might be able to adjust well um this is uh, Gary. I, I, we've got a special guest, uh, it turns out. That's where I was called away, so um, say hello. Hi, everyone. Hey. Uh, yeah, I heard, I heard it's going pretty well. Wow. Having a good time. Well, from that tepid response, yeah. it seemed that you're muted. But anyways. <laughs> uh, the unsung hero, just a representative, an amalgam of all these badges that I have from Anthony Manning, from all of you uh, incredibly wonderful and talented people. They they put me in this comic called The Cyber Hero Adventures, Defenders of the Digital Universe. I'm told you can get it uh, free online at cyberheroescomics.com. And, and I was listening in over on the side, and I, I'd like, if you don't mind, uh, one at a time, starting with uh, Miss D'Amico, can you uh, tell the audience uh, how they can get more information about some of your cool work? I would love to tell you how to get information about Code DX. Code DX is in software security and 
you can get in touch with us at codedx.com. That's C-O-D-E-D-X.com. And you can also link in with me. That's uh, Anita D'Amico. And I will be happy to connect with you and give you more information about uh, CodeDX as well as uh, my research and, and interests. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, uh, Gary. Appreciate it. I'll tell him you said that. Um, you know, and one of the cool things that I'm really passionate about, you know, being from the superhero universe is how to educate children. Davina, how do uh, people learn more about some of the cool stuff that you're doing for K through 12? They can always uh, go to nist.gov slash nice and find out more, or they can contact me at dpruitt at nist.gov. Wow, okay, thanks. And Jen, one of the things I loved about uh, your website is your cool logo. It's a dog, a robot dog. What is that all about and how do people learn more about that? Yes, we actually have him named. His name is Poochie. So Poochie is a blue dog that's associated with Spirion and, and he's helping you sniff out any sensitive data um, that you might have um, on your servers, on your desktops, and helping you classify and, and control and understand and ultimately comply with industry regulations. So yes, you can see Poochie at Spirion.com, which is S-P-I-R-I-O-N.com. Um, I'd encourage anyone to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, which is just at Spirion. Um, you can always reach out to me on, on LinkedIn or Twitter as well. It's just my name, um, at Jen Holtfloor on Twitter, and uh, the same for LinkedIn. So uh, thanks for having me, um, Superhero. I, I appreciate being on here. Yeah, I didn't do anything. It was the other guy. Um, Ms. Cosmano, speaking of Poochie, what is your favorite thing to do? I love hanging out with my uh, golden doodle, Oakley, my mini golden doodle, going to dog parks and on walks. So Jen, I really liked your guy's logo <laughs> when I saw it. <laughs> um, but in terms of OWL, uh, you can, we have 24 by seven live chat on our website. So owlcyberdefense.com. Um, we're on, we're very active on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, so definitely follow us. We uh, post our, our content, our webinars on there. We're holding a bunch during the uh, coronavirus shutdown. So if, you, if you're looking to learn more about cybersecurity, you can uh, sign up for one of those. And we also have our own networking um, events called Cybeer Tech Talks. So we host these at different trade shows we go to throughout the year. And we partner with um, local craft breweries and we provide our attendees free beer tastings. So cybersecurity and beer, nothing could be better than that. Uh, and we have a website, cybertechtalks.com. And then you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. It's just uh, Aileen Casmano, A-I-L-E-E-N. Wow, that's <laughs> fun. And, and uh, Ms. O'Connor, uh, uh, Gary told me that you like sports. What kind of sports do you play anyways? Uh, I play ice hockey. Oh. I've been playing since I was six, yeah. Ice hockey? Yep. And I moved to Boston and they're huge into their sports. Um, I guess I shouldn't say that I'm a Yankees fan there. So hopefully no one's gonna watch there. <laughs> and, uh, you are a Yankees fan? I am, yeah. Yes, okay. I'm from Jersey, so. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> oh, nice. And uh, Ms. O'Connor, how do people get more information about your great group? Yeah, so people can go to cyberreason.com. Cyberreason is one word, one R. Um, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Neve O'Connor. Uh, my name is not spelled the way it sounds, so it should be right there at the bottom of my screen. Um, but we at Cyberreason. N I A M H O apostrophe C O N N O R. Yep. Um, at cyberreason.com, we have um, our platform called The Nest, and we post a lot of blog posts what, about malware, new attacks, um, new threats that we've seen in the wild, um, products, anything really. Um, that's where you can find information about Cyber Reason and the, the services we offer. Well, that's terrific. On behalf of a grateful digital universe, you know, thank you all so much for who you are, 
why you do what you do and what you do as well. So uh, thanks so much. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, stay home, at least for a while. Bye. Thank you, Gary. Bye. Thanks for having me.